The sixth month of the Russian invasion of Ukraine largely continued with a stalemate. Since Russia completed the capture of Luhansk Oblast in early July, not much has changed on the battlefield. Russia continued making small gains in the Donbass front, while Ukraine achieved some success in the Hessian front in late August, along with continuing its campaign of destruction of Russian military infrastructure in the rear, including in Crimea. The situation on the Zaporizhian and the Kharkiv fronts remained mostly stable. In this video, we're going to present a more detailed breakdown of the most important military and political events of the sixth month of the war between Russia and Ukraine. In the first days of August, Russia continued putting pressure on Ukraine's defenses, particularly in Donbass, aiming to decrease the civilian casualties in the unoccupied portions of the Donetsk Oblast the Ukrainian government started mandatory evacuation of all population there, as on August 2nd, the first train with people from Donetsk Oblast left for Kerovorad Oblast. Russia's main target of the advance remained the slovyansk seversk bakhmut Triangle, along with heavily fortified Avdivka and areas surrounding it immediately to the north and to the south. Battles in these areas had been going on since July, and despite the concentration of the bulk of the Russian manpower and firepower in this area, not much had been achieved in the beginning of August. Russia's 4th Guards Tank Division, 90th Guards Tank Division and the 3rd Motor Rifle Division engaged with the Ukrainian 79th Air Assault Brigade and the National Guard units around Dolina, Krasnopilia and Bohorodichna to take full control over the M03 highway and advance to Slovyansk. But since several Russian units had been redeployed from this axis to the Kherson front in order to confront the expected Ukrainian counter-offensive, the Russian army did not possess sufficient troops and firepower to overwhelm the Ukrainian defenders in this area. East of Seversk, in early August, Ukraine largely stood their ground after the front line stabilized following the capture of Lysychansk. Russia had made several attempts to break through the Ukrainian defenses on the Hihirivka Verknokamyanska Ivanoderivka Berestova line, with clashes reported on August 3rd, 7th, 8th, and 11th, without too much to show for it. Russia's biggest success in this area was reaching the western portion of Verknokamyanska, where the elements of the 2nd Army Corps of the LPR pushed back the Kalinuski Regiment. But Ukraine's control over commanding heights between Ivanodarivka and Vimka in the south of the Axis had enabled the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade and the 17th Tank Brigade to stand its ground against the 90th Guards Tank Division and the 55th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade, while near Hryhorivka, the 15th Mechanized Brigade had withstood the pressure of the 150th Motor Rifle Division and the GRU Spetsnaz. Russia continued its attempts to advance on Solodar and Bakhmut, along with capturing the T-1302 highway. In early August, their biggest success in this area was the capture of the Knauf plant in the eastern outskirts of Solodar on August 9th by the 6th Motor Rifle Regiment and the 150th Motor Rifle Division of LPR, with the support of Kadyrov's Chechen battalions against the 58th Motorized Brigade. To the south of Bakhmut, in the line from Kadema to Vizhrozhdenya, Russia achieved some gains west of Parovska and Klenove, where clashes were reported between the 1st and 8th of August. In this area, the 72nd Mechanized Brigade remained under intense pressure from Wagner mercenaries, the Separatist DPR's 5th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade and the Diesel Battalion. Russia also intensified its attempts to break through the fortified area in the town of Avdivka and its surroundings, and their attempts to bypass Avdivka from the south and the north had some success. In the first days of August, the 1st Army Corps of DPR separatists pushed back the 56th Motorized Brigade between Spartak and Mineralne, while by August 4th, the 1st Army Corps of DPR captured at last part of Piski in battles against the 54th Mechanized Brigade in the south of Avdivka. The Ukrainian 110th Mechanized Brigade's defense of Krasnoharivka against the Somali Battalion of DPR and the 4th Motor Rifle Regiment of LPR and the Donbass Battalion's defense of Marinka against the 2nd Army Corps of LPR was more successful. Even though Russia continued holding initiative in Donbass, Ukraine also had some success in the east in early August, as the 93rd Mechanized Brigade, the 95th Airborne Brigade and the 10th Mountain Brigade liberated some land south of Izium, from Dimitrivka towards Tevhenka, pushing back the 3rd Motor Rifle Division, the 13th Guards Tank Regiment and the Gru Spetsnaz units in the process. 
It seems that Ukraine had taken advantage of redeployment of Russian units from this area to the Kherson and Zaporizhian fronts. On the Kharkiv front, the stalemate continued. Heavy battles took place around Udi, where the 200th separate motor rifle brigade engaged with the 113th Territorial Defense Brigade in the Prijanka dementivka sletina area, where the initial success of the 10th Motor Rifle Regiment of DPR on August 2nd in Dementivka was later negated by the pushback of the 28th Tank Battalion and from Tanova to Bayrek, where the 80th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade's advance was repelled by the 117th and 227th Territorial Defense Brigades and the Ukrainian Special Forces. In early August, the slow and grinding pace of operations on both sides continued on the Kherson front. In this period, Russia tried to regain positions which they lost throughout the summer. While the 20th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade's attack on Trudolubivka was repelled by the 60th Motorized Brigade, Russia managed to gain some ground on the Ukrainian bridgehead on the eastern bank of the River Inhulets in battles which intensified after August 5th. There, the 34th Separate Motor Rifle Brigade and the 247th Guards Air Assault Regiment pushed the 105th and the 106th mechanized brigades and the Ukrainian marine units slightly back but failed to destroy the Inhulets bridgehead. On the Zaporizhian front, neither side achieved any meaningful progress either. The only notable event on the battlefield was a small advance of the Russian 13th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade against the 68th Jaeger Brigade towards Mikilska. The rest of the front remained stable as both sides tried to deploy more forces to the area in an attempt to potentially break the stalemate. But while the Zaporizhian front remained largely stable, since early August, the situation in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant started to alarm the international community. On August 3rd, the chief of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, stated that the situation at the plant was completely out of control under the Russian administration, and that every principle of nuclear safety has been violated. According to the Institute for the Study of War, Russian forces based around the NPP have attacked Ukrainian positions in Nikopol and elsewhere in recent weeks, intentionally putting Ukraine in a difficult position. Either Ukraine returns fire, risking international condemnation and a nuclear incident, which Ukrainian forces are unlikely to do, or Ukrainian forces allow Russian forces to continue firing on Ukrainian positions from an effective safe zone. Both sides blamed each other for the situation at the power plant throughout August. Grossi called Ukraine and Russia to facilitate an inspection visit of the atomic agency to the power plant. On August 5th, Russian opposition media outlet The Insider reported that Russian forces had mined the turbine room of Energy Block 1 of the power plant. Other sources suggest that Russian soldiers, military vehicles, explosives and anti-aircraft guns were stationed within the plant. More evidence of Russia storing military equipment in and around the plant emerged on August 21st, as satellite imagery from that date showed that Russian military equipment had been placed within 60 meters of Reactor 5. On August 6th, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky condemned Russia for shelling of the power plant as an act of terror and called on the international community to recognize Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. On August 14th, 42 states called on Russia to remove its forces from the power plant. On August 25th, the Ukrainian nuclear operator Energoatom claimed that the Russian shelling had caused fire at ash pits near the Zaporizhian thermal power plant, approximately 5 kilometers from the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant. At the end of August, Russia at last agreed to the inspection of the power plant by the IAEA delegation headed by Grossi. Since shelling of the area occurs quite regularly, and all evidence shows that the Russian army is storing its troops, military vehicles and equipment in the territory of the power plant, the threat of a nuclear disaster is real, and we can just hope that it can be avoided through demilitarization of the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant. On August 4th, a prominent global human rights organization, Amnesty International, accused Ukraine of violating the principles of the international humanitarian law by deploying its forces and military equipment in civilian areas and buildings, and firing on Russian positions from there. This caused an outrage in the Ukrainian government, 
as Zelensky refuted Amnesty's claim, blaming the organization of shifting the responsibility from the aggressor to the victim. Since Ukraine's only viable strategy, especially at the beginning of the war, when the forces were particularly unequal, was drawing the Russian forces into cities and bleeding them out in costly urban battles, one could question how Ukraine could have possibly avoided a quick military defeat while accommodating all provisions of the international humanitarian law. Which, to put it lightly, Russia has had no intentions of observing since the start of the invasion. On August 6th, several reports about Ukrainian partisan and sabotage activities emerged. The deputy head of the Russian occupation authorities in Novokokovka, Vitaly Hur, was shot and died soon after. On the same day, an explosion was reported at a police station in occupied Berdyansk. On August 9th, a very important milestone was passed by the Ukrainian army in this war. Earlier in the war, many thought that Crimea was off-limits. For more than five months, no military actions took place in Crimea. Russian officials explicitly warned Ukraine against attacking the Russian annexed peninsula. In mid-July, former Russian president and now the deputy chairman of the Russian Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, stated that in case of a Ukrainian attack on Crimea, Judgment Day will come very fast and hard, it will be very difficult to hide. Nevertheless, on August 9th, at least nine Russian aircraft were destroyed after an explosion at the Sapki military airbase of Russia in Novofedorivka, Crimea, making it the single biggest loss of Russian aircraft since the Second World War. The base is around 220 kilometers away from the Ukrainian positions, which made it impossible to target it by the GMLRS missiles supplied to Ukraine by the US for the HIMARS. Neither Russia nor Ukraine acknowledged that this was caused by a Ukrainian action, but ironic comments from the Ukrainian officials indicated that this was in fact done by the Ukrainian army operating behind Russian lines, while the official Russian side insisted that explosions occurred due to negligence. The comments President Zelensky made on the following day made it clear that it was indeed a Ukrainian operation. He said that, This Russian war began with Crimea and must end with Crimea, with its liberation. On the same day, an ammunition depot in Henishensk, Crimea was struck too. Again, it was out of HIMARS reach, so how exactly an explosion occurred can only be guessed. On August 16th, explosions occurred at a Russian ammunition depot in Jankoy district of Crimea and at an airfield near Fardiska, Crimea, and an anonymous senior Ukrainian official told the New York Times that it was another operation conducted by Ukrainian special forces behind Russian lines. On August 18th, another explosion in Crimea was reported, this time near the Belbek Air Base. On August 30th, it was reported that an oil depot was hit in the village of Chevonovhadiska of Crimea. Ukraine's operations in Crimea demonstrated that it has grown in confidence to conduct sabotage operations deep behind enemy lines in the region, which many expected to remain out of reach of the Ukrainian army. Moreover, these operations had caused further damage on Russian supplies in the south of Ukraine in preparation for an expected Ukrainian counteroffensive in the Hessian Oblast. According to the Ukrainian Main Military Intelligence Directorate, the Russian command had been relocating its aircraft deeper in the Crimean Peninsula and to Russia in order to safeguard them from Ukrainian sabotage operations. The Russian authorities in occupied Crimea also installed checkpoints in Sevastopol to find Ukrainian saboteurs. On August 12th, Ukraine damaged the last functioning bridge that the Russian army used to supply its troops in Hersen Oblast, near the Kakovka hydroelectric power plant, making it impassable. According to the UK Ministry of Defense, at that point, Russia could only supply its soldiers by two pontoon bridges. This paved the way for the emergence of reports that the Russian command on the western bank of the Dnipro River of the Hersen Oblast relocated to the eastern bank. On the same day, elements of the 1st Army Corps of the Separatist DPR gained some ground from Holivka towards Zaitseva, pushing back the 46th Airborne Brigade. Between August 12th and 14th, heavy fighting occurred south of Avdivka, where reportedly the 1st Army Corps of the DPR separatists advanced in Piski and near Spartak and Mineralna. Two days later, LPR separatists achieved small gains towards Novomikhailovka and Solodka in the south of Marienka. It is interesting that a day before this offensive, 
one of the LPR units shared a video, where they stated their displeasure about fighting for the DPR claimed territories. On August 17th, Russia finally dismissed the commander of its Black Sea fleet, Igor Osipov, after several setbacks, such as the sinking of the Moskva cruiser and the loss of Zminyi Island. He was replaced by Vice Admiral Viktor Sokolov. On August 18th, in Lviv, Zelensky met with the Turkish President Erdogan and UN Secretary General Guterres to discuss the situation around the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant, the Grain Deal, and potential peace talks with Russia. On August 20th, the Ukrainian government reported that Russia and Belarus signed defense agreements, which stipulated that Russian military aviation equipment would be repaired in Belarus. Between August 21st to 24th, the 136th Guards Motor Rifle Brigade and the Kalmyus Brigade of the DPR separatists recaptured Yeherivka, while in the Kherson front, the 20th Guards Motor Rifle Division pushed back the Ukrainian Territorial Defense Brigades to take control of Blahadashna. On August 21st, the Russian propagandist Daya Degina, the daughter of Kremlin ideologue Alexander Dugin, was killed in a car blast under suspicious circumstances. Ukraine officially denied any involvement while the exiled former Russian MP Ilya Ponomarev claimed that the attack was conducted by the National Republican Army, a Russian partisan group. Nevertheless, the Russian FSB announced fairly quickly that the attack was planned and carried out by the Ukrainian citizen Natalia Vovk, but the only proof they showed was a grainy video of someone resembling Vovk in Russia. On August 22nd, a shocking report about forceful transfer of over 1,000 children from Mariupol to different regions of Russia emerged. According to this report, these children were transferred to Russia for adoption by Russian families, in a blatant violation of the UN Genocide Convention. On the same day, the administrative building of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic was struck. Separatist leader Denis Pashilin was not in the building at that moment but three people were killed as a result of this strike. On the following day, Russia conducted a missile attack on a railway station in Chaplina, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, which killed at least 25 people. Also on August 24th, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu stated that at the meeting of defense ministers of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, that Russia was deliberately slow in its pace of advance in order to avoid civilian casualties. Given the Russian negligence for civilian lives in the war in Ukraine so far, the massacre in Bucha, and regular destruction of Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, it is very difficult to believe Shoigu. The slow Russian advance is not deliberate, it is a result of heavy Ukrainian resistance. Other evidence of the so-called special military operation not going according to plan was the August 25th decree of Vladimir Putin ordering the increase of the number of active military personnel for Russia by 137,000. It is unclear how the Russian government was going to achieve this increase without declaring at least a partial mobilization. Such an increase could possibly be achieved through attracting more people to the Russian army as contract servicemen, or incorporation of new volunteer battalions to the Russian army. The report about the recently formed 3rd Army Corps of Russia being sent to the border with Ukraine also informed us about the Kremlin's unhappiness with developments on the battlefield, as the Russian command hoped that deployment of new units might turn the tide. The expectation was that they were going to be deployed to the Zaporizhian and Kharkiv fronts, where Russian troops were reported to be relatively undermanned. On the diplomatic front, on the first day of August, the UN and Turkey brokered grain export deal between Ukraine and Russia saw its first results. On that day, the first Ukrainian vessel carrying grain left Odessa and headed to Lebanon. In the first week of August, seven more ships carrying Ukrainian grain and corn left Ukrainian Black Sea ports to transport this vital product to international markets. Also on August 1st, the US announced its 17th aid package to Ukraine, worth $550 million, which included ammunition for M777 howitzers and HIMARS. Along with that, German Mars-2 multiple rocket launcher systems and four additional HIMARS arrived in Ukraine. But even though Western arms support to Ukraine has been regular, President Zelensky's comments on August 2nd made it clear that Ukraine needed more. 
Zelensky claimed that despite the support, Ukraine had still not reached parity in heavy guns and firepower with Russia. This is very much felt in combat, especially in Donbass. It's just hell there. Words cannot describe it. Throughout August, Ukraine's allies announced additional military aid to Ukraine. On August 8th, 19th and 24th, the United States announced its 18th, 19th and 20th military aid packages to Ukraine, which included more HIMARS, M777, NASAMs and HARM rockets and shells, Javelins, Scan Eagle surveillance drones, Claymore mines, six NASAMs air defense systems, more artillery systems and vehicles. The 20th military aid package, dedicated to the anniversary of Ukrainian independence, is particularly notable for being worth almost $3 billion. On August 10th, British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace pledged two more M270 MLRS. On August 11th, the Northern European allies of Ukraine raised 1.5 billion euros for military aid to Ukraine. On August 13th, Swedish Defence Minister Peter Huthqvist stated Sweden's readiness to directly produce weapons for Ukraine. On August 24th, still British Prime Minister Boris Johnson pledged an additional £54 million of military aid to Ukraine. Ukraine's Western allies continued to provide military supplies to Ukraine throughout August, and there is no indication that this is going to stop. And it should be noted that the Ukrainian military aid through the Ukrainian Lend Lease Act had not started yet in August, as the Ukrainian government officials predicted that Lend-Lease supplies will start arriving in the fall of 2022. Western military support has allowed Ukraine to inflict significant damage on Russian military infrastructure in Ukraine, as Ukraine continued targeting Russian ammunition and oil depots. Explosions were reported at the oil depot in Markivka on August 3rd, near Oleshki on August 5th, at the Antonivsky Bridge on August 8th, at Chonha on August 10th, at Vesela on August 11th, at the Russian base in Tokmak and ammunition depot in Rodokovka on August 15th, at an ammunition depot in Ambrosivka on August 18th, at ammunition depots in Donetsk and Novokarkovka on August 22nd, at the Antonivsky Bridge again on August 25th, and across Hesson Oblast on August 27th. A whopping 48 HIMARS and M270 strikes were conducted by Ukraine from August 29th to 31st. This list is by no means exhaustive. Ukraine continued using HIMARS and other MLRS provided by the West successfully to diminish the Russian firepower and destroy key supply lines. For instance, according to the Russian-appointed Kherson Occupation Administration official Kirill Stremisov, the Antonivsky Bridge, which is a key line of supply for Russian troops stationed in Kherson Oblast, had been closed to traffic since July 26 to 27. However, Ukraine was not the only country that got foreign military supplies in this war. Several reports of Iranian drones being purchased by Russia emerged throughout August. On August 2nd, unconfirmed reports claiming that Iran had sent the first batch of its drones to Russia for testing, in exchange for Russian Su-35s, emerged. Three days later, the advisor to the Ukrainian presidential administration, Alexei Arestovich, claimed that Iran had supplied 46 drones to Russia. He went even further to state that Russia had already started using these drones in Ukraine. According to Arestovich, this included Shahed-129 strike drones. On August 29th, the Washington Post cited unnamed security officials from the United States and its allies, who suggested that on August 19th, Iran delivered at least two types of drones to Russia, most probably Shahed-129 and Shahed-191 strike drones, along with Mahaja-6 strike and surveillance drones. The report also noted that the Russians were not satisfied with these drones. Nevertheless, this was the first claimed foreign weapon supply to Russia since the start of the invasion. The war in Ukraine has been raging for over six months. Neither side managed to break the stalemate throughout August. Russia continues to focus on grinding through the Ukrainian defenses amid heavy losses in Donbass, while Ukraine finally started its long-awaited counter-offensive in Kherson. The status quo in the Kharkiv and Zaporizhia fronts remained largely unchanged. According to the Institute for the Study of War, since restarting its offensive operations on July 16th, Russia had managed to capture only about 450 square kilometers, or 0.08% of Ukrainian territory, and in total controls about 19.48% of Ukraine. 
Western military aid, particularly multiple rocket launcher systems, has largely halted the Russian advance. Russian intentions to hold referendums in occupied regions in order to ultimately annex them look far-fetched at the moment too. The counteroffensive in Kherson and continued partisan activities in the occupied areas make realization of these plans in September unlikely. Both sides continued suffering heavy losses. The most recent estimate of manpower losses of Russia was made by the Pentagon on August 8th, according to which Russia has suffered 70 to 80,000 killed and wounded. The number of Ukrainian losses is unclear. On August 22nd, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, Valery Zaluzhny, said that about 9,000 Ukrainian soldiers had died since the start of the war. But almost three months before that, on June 3rd, the presidential advisor, Alexei Aristovich, suggested a higher number of casualties, at around 10,000. According to the Oryx military blog, these are visually confirmed losses of Russian equipment by September 2nd. 994 tanks, 2,055 vehicles, 113 command posts and communication stations, 16 heavy mortars, 267 artillery pieces and vehicles, 90 multiple rocket launches, 52 aircraft, 49 helicopters, and 121 drones. On the Ukrainian side, the visually confirmed equipment losses are the following. 249 tanks, 609 vehicles, 7 command posts and communication stations, 115 artillery pieces and vehicles, 22 multiple rocket launches, 41 aircraft, 13 helicopters, and 33 drones. Unfortunately, more videos on this conflict are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. This is Kings and Generals, and we will catch you on the next one.